So if I took a survey and asked people to share their favorite Thanksgiving verse or verses, I'm pretty sure many of us would stick to what we call the classics, like Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and its courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Or Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, give thanks to the Lord of lords, to him who alone does great wonders, to him who by understanding made the heavens, to him who spread out the earth above the waters, to him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, the moon and stars to rule over the night. And of course, each of those verses is followed with the refrain, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the psalm goes on to give thanks, not only for what God has made, but also, if you look further in that psalm, for what God has done, how God has rescued and provided for his people. From the New Testament, we might think of Paul's command in 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, that you would give thanks in all circumstances. Or maybe you would think of Paul's words in Colossians 3, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Great verses. We are obviously encouraged and commanded to give thanks. But I doubt if anyone, without a hint from me, would have picked the verse or verses we'll think about today. Romans 1, 21 to 23. And yet these are verses that have struck me over and over in recent years. Okay, so Romans, the first chapters of Romans seek to prove the thesis of Romans 1.16 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So to prove this, Paul first has to convince us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, these present a fairly extensive catalog of sins and a strong argument that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that none is righteous, no, not one. But the very first sins mentioned are not sins of behavior, they are sins of attitude and intention. Back to Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They suppress the truth. That's, that's the first concrete sin listed. If you want to disobey God, the first thing you need to do is to suppress the truth about God. Deny his power. Deny his love. Deny especially his goodness. When Satan tempted Eve, it was by denying God's good intention, denying that the restriction God had placed on them was for their good. And yet it was for their good. Because to have an experiential knowledge of evil, which is what the temptation was to, to have that experiential knowledge would be and was for them and for all of us a catastrophe. So Paul goes on in Romans to say that God's power and his goodness 
and even his love continue to be displayed to all people through the goodness of creation. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to him them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. People see what God has made, and if they deny the truth, they deny God's power, and they deny his divine nature, his goodness and his love, which is so evident even in the way creation has been designed to offer perfect provision and perfect beauty. So this first sin, denying God's goodness, denying the truth, is joined in Romans 1 by two more, Romans 1, 21 to 23. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were dark and claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So again, verse 21, here's the focus. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Now, of all the sins that Paul could have cited as being foundational to the wrath and judgment of God, the one he mentions, one of the ones he mentions, is the failure to give thanks. Why does he include that? And how do we respond if we find unthankfulness in our own hearts? So as I thought about all this, I googled the phrase, the sin of thanklessness. One of the first hits I got was a blog by Brian Jay, a missionary and pastor. He's written some good stuff. I'm going to quote him several times this morning. And he begins by offering a definition of giving thanks. We give thanks when we acknowledge the goodness of another as it is expressed to us in real benefits. He says, when I first began to work on this definition, I used the term tangible benefits, but I changed that because tangible means that we can touch them. What I'm trying to communicate through the term real benefits is that thankfulness is not just a vague, general sort of thing, but it's always related to some specific benefit or blessing that is very real and concrete. Forgiveness is not tangible, but it is a very real benefit. Food to eat is tangible, and it's also a real benefit. Both are things for which we should be thankful. So there are several verses in the New Testament that reinforce what Brian Jay says in his definition. First, this is how Jesus gave thanks. He gave thanks to the Father for the bread and the fish before he served the multitudes. He gave thanks to the Father before giving the bread and wine to his disciples at the Last Supper. In Luke 17, the one leper of the ten who were healed fell on his face and he gave thanks to Jesus for his healing. Paul often began his letters right, by giving thanks to God for the church to whom he was writing. And in Revelation 11, the 24 elders fall on their faces and they give thanks to the Lord God Almighty who was and is, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. So you see the pattern there already. Thankfulness is always expressed for something, for food or for healing or for other believers or even for Jesus himself, for the exercise of his reign. But it's also an important part of the definition that thankfulness is always to someone. For thanksgiving to occur, there must be something that one is thankful for, and there must be someone that one is thankful to. So let's say a child gets a gift for Christmas, and he may love and enjoy that gift and be really happy he has a gift. There, there is something he is glad for, but if that gladness and joy isn't expressed to someone, then we will correct and even reprimand that child for not being thankful. We give thanks when we acknowledge the goodness of another as expressed to us in real benefits. 
When Paul sees God's wrath then coming on those who don't give thanks to God, he's saying, first of all, that there has been some very real benefit that they are ignoring. So we study the passage, and we often look at what it says about God being revealed in creation. We say the people should have seen the sun, the stars, the earth, the, the moon, and everything around them from the greatest to smallest, and seen that there is a creator God at work. And that's true. That honors God. But Paul says they should not only have honored God, they should also have given thanks to him. I mean, thankfulness has an added dimension that, that the perception of these things, even giving honor, don't. It recognizes the benefit received. Not only is God God, but he blesses us through these things. So what benefits have people received? Paul explains in Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God gives all people their very existence, their very life, their very breath, everything they have, every single concrete individual thing that they enjoy and experience comes from God. So Paul is saying far more than simply the people should have recognized the existence of God through creation. He's saying, you owe everything to God, and you have not thanked him for giving you everything pertaining to your existence. So Brian Jay thinks about this, and he says, it still doesn't seem to me to answer the question of why this failure to give thanks leads to God's wrath. And he finds the answer in the first part of his definition. Thankfulness is expressed for something, but also to someone. Appreciating blessings and benefits is meaningless if it isn't directed to someone, to the person who actually gave the benefits. Now, some people will fail to recognize the benefit, but more people will we'll enjoy the benefits of all that God has done while denying the goodness of the one who gave them. Uh, even the Israelites, all right, they escaped from Egypt. They were in the desert. God gave them manna and water. And it was bad enough when they complained against God because there was no food. But how much worse when they complained against God after he had given this blessing, this manna for heaven. They, they enjoyed the blessing, but denied his goodness. Now, I love Jimmy Stewart, most of the movies he's made, but in the well-known movie Shenandoah, he illustrates this thanklessness in a particularly direct way. Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We work dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Sometimes we fall into that trap. So I, I would say to Jimmy Stewart, yeah, you plowed the land, but who made the land? You created the world. Who created the world and made it able to stay, sustain life? Yeah, you sowed the seeds, but who made the seeds? Who created life itself in all its variety and suitability for human needs? Yeah, you plowed, you harvested, but who sent the rain? Who sent the sunshine? You worked dog bone hard, but your work would be useless without God's grace. A thankful person isn't someone, just someone who's glad he has a benefit, Glad he has a blessing to enjoy. Rather, he is one who acknowledges the goodness of the one who does the blessing. You can't be thankful to your house for keeping you warm this past week. But you can be thankful to God for giving you the house with a working heater. I mean, God shows himself in creation. He does. And he gives us blessings and benefits of our very existing 
sins so that we will see his goodness. And then to turn around and to scorn the giver of life and to scorn existence, to scorn his infinite goodness is, is the worst abuse of thanklessness. So Brian Jay concludes that scorning an infinite God is an infinite sin and one that is worthy of infinite condemnation. Thanklessness is more significant than you may think. Thankfulness is also more significant than you may think because thankfulness keeps the right person, God and his glory and his goodness, at the center of our lives where it belongs. So beware, beware, beware the sin of thankfulness. Search yourself. Paul goes on in verses 22 and 23 to reveal the most common sign of thankfulness, thanklessness. Just ignore the fact that I do that about half the time. Put the right word in the sentence. Thanklessness. All right, the sign of thanklessness is idolatry. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. We've talked about idolatry a lot in recent years. I'm not going to spend a ton of time rehearsing all that now, except to remind you that idolatry doesn't have to focus on these images, these pagan idols. Rather, idolatry is depending on anything other than God for your ultimate satisfaction and hope. If your hope is in material things, that's idolatry. If your hope is in relationships other than the one with God, that's idolatry. If your hope is in the next pleasure to satisfy you and give you meaning, whether that's pleasure from drugs or sex or power or whatever, it's idolatry. All those forms of idolatry suppress the truth of the one true God. They fail to honor him as God, and they fail to give thanks to him for what he's done. Instead, idolatry tries to pretend that there is someone else, something else to be thankful for. And most of our idols in our culture are something else that we think we can be thankful to, something to be thankful for, and in many cases, something to be thankful for and in our culture, with nothing, no reference to someone to be thankful to. It just happened. We, we thank you, God. We, no, I'm sorry, we don't thank you, God. We, we thank you without a person. So we need to examine ourselves for idolatry. Anything we're putting hope in apart from God. Anything in our lives that we can't live without that is not God himself. And especially, there are things in our lives where, where we know it would just be wrong to thank God for them. That, that's the wealth, maybe. Certainly alcohol or drugs or, or inappropriate sex or power or even the abundance of possessions. We know that, that these are not things you know, that we should be thankful to God for. These are things that we have appropriated for ourselves and made idols. So thankfulness is more important than you might think. Keep that in mind this week and recognize that putting our hope, our trust, our dependence in anything other than God is a sign that we are not being truly thankful to him for all that he has given. But we also need to recognize that just as thanklessness is cursed, so also thankfulness is blessed. Brian Chase says, Giving thanks is a blessing because the joy and gratitude and happiness that we feel when we are thankful isn't primarily from the benefit that we received, but from the goodness of the one who gives us this benefit. That's awesome because it says that the real blessing, thankfulness, makes us consciously aware of the goodness of God. And to be aware of God's goodness is to have joy, to have happiness, to have satisfaction, witnessing daily to the goodness of what he has done and what he has given. That's the blessing of thankfulness is it puts us in touch with those things. So how can I begin to walk daily in this blessing? 
How can I experience the joy and satisfaction that it offers? Do I just go outside, look up at the stars, or at the autumn leaves, or at the glories of creation, and thank God for this creation and for my existence? Sure. Yeah, you can do that. And, and you should do that. It's awesome. But for the person not yet saved, even sincere gratefulness like that cannot undo the sin already committed of suppressing the truth, not honoring God, not having been thankful. I mean, that sin is past. It's on the books. Because of the penalty for sin, we cannot become thankful people by making a list, even a true list, of blessings that God has given. A lack of thankfulness condemns us. But, but trying to be thankful does not save us, does not rescue us from that condemnation. There is only one way we can become thankful people, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ, where he took upon himself the wrath of God that we had earned. He took on himself human flesh. He suffered the just penalty for our sins, for our rejection. And when God did this, recognize this, when God did this, it was a far greater display of his goodness than the creation of the entire universe. Through creation, God's eternal power, his divine nation, nature are seen, but through the cross, his justice and his grace are clearly seen. <laughs> That's the ground of thankfulness. So Brian Jay says, how can we experience the bracelet of thankfulness? We do it by living a cross-centered life. He says, I began a practice some time ago that should be a second nature to all of us as Christians, and that is to thank God every day for what he did for us at the cross. He says, I'm sad to say that I don't have this godly habit yet ingrained in my life. Like, I wish I did. But by his grace, I will. <laughs> May not a day go by that I don't thank God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> that I don't thank my Lord for his death for me on the cross. And Brian Jay goes on to say, I deserve hell, but I get heaven. I deserve separation from God, and instead he adopts me into his family. He cherishes me as he does his only begotten son. Imagine the difference it will make in your life if you meditate every day on the wonderful grace of Jesus expressed to you at the cross. And as I thank him for salvation, may it remind me of what an infinitely good God he is. Thankfulness is a huge blessing because it reminds us of the goodness of God. And second, thank him for his gifts. Every good gift that comes into your life is due to the cross of Christ. When God blesses you as his child with anything, no matter how small, remember this. If Jesus had died on the cross for you, he would not be blessing you now with that, that meal or that car, or that relationship, or anything. It's all because of Jesus' cross. Now, you may wonder, no, but well, what are the, about those who are not followers of Christ? Where, where do the benefits in their lives come from? And I would say to you that the answer is the same. They come from the cross of Christ. Why? Because through the cross, Jesus not only saved individuals, he saved the world from its condemnation and brokenness. Now, that rescue is not yet fully realized, but always, since the fall, it has been anticipated, and God has poured out common grace to people across the world, not because they deserved it, not because they deserved it, but because of Jesus and the hope and rescue that God knew would be found in him. Brian Jay goes on to say, not only are the good things that come into your life through the cross of Christ to be thanked, but so are the difficult things. Even the difficult things give us the opportunity for the blessing of thanksgiving. Peter said, rejoice. 
insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. God has promised us that our sufferings are not pointless, our difficulties not pointless. God promises in 2 Corinthians that this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. There is an often believed lie in the church today that obedience and submission to God means that everything will go well for you, that you'll have material wealth, that you'll never suffer. But the promise of the cross is that we are blessed to share in Christ's sufferings and still be thankful for that blessing. Sometimes God removes his material blessings from us, and he wants to show us that the greatest blessing, the greatest reason for thankfulness is Jesus himself and nothing else. So we focus on the goodness of the cross. We focus on the goodness of what God gives. We continue to focus that way even in difficulties. And maybe as kind of a fourth step, we do work to rid ourselves of those things in our lives that are a distraction from focusing on the cross. The, the idols of our age are so compelling, so captivating. Entertainment, materialism, success, sex, and other pleasures that we end up with no time to live a cross-centered life. I, even the good things that God gives us can become idols in our lives if they keep us from that focus on God. So don't expect to become a thankful person by, by simply adding the cross to a life that in all other ways shows no recognition, desire, or focus on God. The overall direction, the movement of your life is to be toward Jesus. And then you will receive the blessings of thankfulness. When Jesus cried on, died on the cross, he accomplished our reconciliation. And that is the gift he has given us. The way is opened for us to have fellowship with God. So, wouldn't you agree that the, the greatest thanklessness that a person to express, could express would be a failure to appreciate and use and enjoy the gift that they had been given? So, going back to those kids, what would be more painful for your child? When their brother and sister unwraps a toy that, that the child spent all their allowance to buy and immediately begins playing with it but forgets to say thank you? Or what if that child opened it and then cast it aside disinterested, looking for the next present. That's thanklessness, to not use what God has given. So do you want to enjoy? <laughs> do you want to be a thankful person? Then enjoy the gift that God has given you. What is the gift that God has given you? Himself. He has given you himself. Thank you, Jesus. So I heard a story about a missionary wife. She'd been without her husband for 10 weeks. He was touring around the churches of this country. On the day he was supposed to come home, a huge package arrived instead for this lady delivered by a truck. It was from her husband, but she was so disappointed. She didn't want a present. She wanted him. When she opened the box, out he popped. That's what God has done for us. He has reconciled us to himself. He has given himself to us. He has shown us the ultimate goodness. He himself is the ultimate gift. How can we not thank him? 